everyone, Sam here. Good to see everyone. Happy holidays. Let's get started. I'm going to jump right in here because uh, we do have to end a little bit earlier than we normally do. There's a little, little conflict, but um, we do have more sessions coming up. Anybody has any questions, comments as we go along? Um, just uh, let me know. Okay. So we're going to, um, so the kind of the topic today is kind of trading traps. And I thought what we would do is dive into the, spend uh, all of our time on the live markets, but really stick to the theme of, um, you know, trading traps. So risk is dis risk disguised as opportunity. If you've ever taken a trade where you buy and the market almost immediately goes down or you sell short at the market, you know, just really rallies against you and you thought you're entering the perfect trade and it just really goes in the opposite direction quickly. Um, sure, sure that can happen from time to time, but, um, uh, but often there's a there's a reason it's it's it, there there's a you know again it's a risk disguised as opportunity. Uh, I'll bring up the live charts here in a second. For those that want more than what we're just going to go over than what we're going to go over today, in kind of a deeper dive into strategy. I am uh, delivering a free workshop tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, you see over there on the right on the advanced side, and I will put a link for that in the chat. There it is if you're interested. You can always just uh, uh, show up tomorrow. We'll be able to spend a little over an hour, uh, an uh, hour or so tomorrow, uh, deeper dive into strategy and all that. Anyway, let's dive into the, let's pull up the markets here. Now, I can go over uh, any market you like to for, for anything we're, we're going to talk about here. Uh, what markets we look at doesn't matter. So if you have a market you want to look at, uh, just let me know and I can I can pull it up. We will apply. Uh, the link should be right there in the chat. There you go. And um, yeah, so I can look at, uh, we can, what we'll do today is really apply the supply and demand strategy, um, structure, location, all of the stuff that we, that we uh, talk about with strategy. We'll just do it through the through the live markets, right? We can look at uh, the FX markets. We can really look at any market. We can certainly look at the SPY. There's no supply in the SPY that's uh, here, but, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, we do have demand zones. There you go. You should be able to see the screen, by the way. The SPY's coming up. There it is. So the higher probability demand zones um, we do have a new footprint of demand up here around the 471.50. Akira, I know you're asking for SPY, um, but the higher probability demand zones are going to be uh, likely found down here, the starting at the 466.50. And the higher probability one than that will be down here at the 462.50. Now, because these demand zones are inside of this range, remember if you've been in our sessions before, this is something we go over a lot, you know, a lot more in the workshop tomorrow. Um, structure, location, location is key. We typically are not interested in demand zones inside a range like this. Okay, what we require, what the strategy requires, is inverse help. So we're looking at an equity index market here, the SPY, which is the ETF for the S&P. We do have a certain number of inverse markets um, and, uh, you know, that will likely, will likely match up with one or, or two of these zones, right? So, um, yeah, so we can look, let's go over to one of those bond markets. I see you're talking about the 30-year there we can take a look at the 30 year uh, or the 10 year okay the 30 year uh, you could see there's a, we were just sitting right on top of a demand zone here so we still didn't get back there but I see you mentioned that in the chat this is one of the inverse markets to equities 
So this, even though we don't have a clear supply in the S and P, for example, that we just looked at, we uh, we do have a qualified demand zone here in an inverse market to equities. So this zone down here is uh, not bullish stocks; it's bearish stocks. So stocks into supply, bonds into this demand zone, that's a higher probability event. Does that make sense? This is just one of those markets. So we'll, uh, we'll look for the third year to come down into here, and that would likely turn help turn equities lower. However, if the bond market, for example, um, let's go to the, let's go to this chart right here. You know, if the 30 year, for example, comes up into here, or more specifically, let's go to the 10 year. So the 10 year has a, I believe it's right up here. There it is. So we have a couple overnight supply zones here. That's what the gray circle means. Remember, we color code, our, I'm throwing a lot at you now, I know that, but we color code our supply demand zones based on probability, right? Structure, location. So um, up around uh, 130, 29 and a half. Uh, or you could just go with 131 right up in here, right? This area right up there. Okay. So bond market up into a supply zone like that with the S&P potentially down into um, that one or better yet, this one, that's that inverse help that we're looking for. Does that make sense? And this is just one set. We can look at any market and there are a set of inverse markets for that market. FX, right, forex markets, energy markets, metals markets, right, stocks, whatever, doesn't matter. The dollar is key in, in all of this, so um, anyway, okay. So that's the, that's the uh, someone asked for the SPY, someone mentioned the bonds. So that's, uh, that's those two markets. Um, and then the other zone that we've, um, well, we can leave it at that. NASDAQ, sure. So the NASDAQ is a, is a good market to look at that's coming down pretty hard at the moment. So the NASDAQ zone that we've, um, here, let me get you that here. So believe it or not, it seems like it's so far right now, but just the last two weeks, we came down into our below the range location rise, right? Below the range demand zones. Um, full disclosure, we actually took trades here in the queues. Uh, but anyway, you can see how far we've come from that. Now we have what looks like, right, really nice demand zones here, nice rally-based rallies. But remember, the majority of rally-based rallies and the majority of drop-based drops will fail, right? Price won't turn uh, when it gets to those zones again. The, the difference is location. I can't emphasize enough how important that is. So when these are inside of this, we require the strategy, and again, I'll go over this more tomorrow in the workshop, but the strategy requires inverse help. So we won't enter these positions unless we have one of our inverse markets to equities into supply. Is everybody crystal clear on that? Jamal, it, it totally depends what you're, are you day trading, are you swing trading, are you longer term position trading, that's the, uh, that's the question. Yeah, and Mark, I, I read your question quickly there, but yes, that's, we talk about location, the range, that's what we're talking about here. Because remember, so what we're, what we're, what we're focused on is how big is the supply demand imbalance? That's all that matters, right? When you're, answer, when you're asking the question, is price likely to turn at, a, at an area, at a supplier demand zone or what have you? 
the, the real question is, well, how big is the supply-demand imbalance? That's, that's the answer. So, you know, the supply-demand imbalance, the level of supply-demand imbalance is these zone, in these zones, because they're inside this range, is not likely to be anywhere near the imbalance of a zone like this, which is below this range. Does that make sense? That's why we we focus on these. Now, we're looking at the last few charts here are more swing trading type time frames. If you're a day trader, you do the same concept, structure, location, on the smaller time frames, right? One, two, five, maybe 10-minute charts. Okay. Um, so anyway, there, there you go. And when we talk about trading traps, risk disguises opportunity. One of the big things is, and I have a slide, I have a specific screenshot on this uh, that I will go over tomorrow in that workshop, but it's mainly focused on invitations to buy and sell in the market. Most are going to be related to conventional technical analysis, trend trading, things like that. And let me just kind of start you know, right at the main point. Remember, the only way to make money trading right, or investing, what have you, is when we buy into a market, others have to buy after us at higher prices or we can't really make money there, right? When we, uh, when we sell short in a market, others have to sell after us at lower prices or there's really no way to make money in that. So the question is, when we buy into a market, are others likely to buy from us at higher prices? That's why trend traders have such a hard time. They buy after a big rally in price. They sell after a big drop in price. That's why indicator and oscillator buyers and sellers, right, conventional technical analysis tools have a hard time. They buy after a rally in price. They sell after a drop in price. The chart pattern people, same thing. Okay, so be very careful with that. Even though those are conventional ways of doing things and they dominate the trading education world, it doesn't mean that they work. Because don't forget the most important metric in all of this. It's, and the metric is not, the one I'm talking about is not where a price is going to turn. It's who makes money at this. And, and the majority of active traders fail. So, you know, one of the simple answers is be careful doing what the majority of traders do. Okay? Let me just look back in the chat here. Um, let's see. Sam, last time you mentioned 1876 gold supply level. It dropped $100 from it. Can you uh, share? Let's see. Why didn't you choose the upper levels and that? Um, yeah, we can go look at that. Are you talking about the gold futures or GLD? You're probably talking about the futures but we can certainly take a look. Uh, Kareem, yes, absolutely. So that's another thing we go over in the classes is uh, our, our rules for, we have a rule for everything, but entry, stop, target, we absolutely have rules for that. And one of them is we're always entering the position, right, our, our, our buy limit, or sell limit to enter the position is always just before the qualified supplier demand zone. Always just before it, not at the zone. The reason for that is, at a qualified demand zone, and when we say qualified, it means structure and location is okay. Um, there's, a, there's likely to be a big supply demand imbalance there, right? A lot of demand. So we don't want to buy where there's a lot of competition to buy. We want to buy just before that. Uh, 18, let's see, 1876 here. Oh, wrong market. Wait a second, that doesn't look like gold. Um, there we go. Four hour, okay, that helps. Let's take a look. Actually, let me go just a little bit bigger time frame so we can see it all in one screenshot.
Um, there's the 19, uh, 17, and then the, uh, oh, this one. Yeah, I remember, uh, I remember that. And we could probably combine these two. Yeah, so this 1876 here. So two, two things to this one. First of all, when price was here, right, I know we were in our, one of our FX Street sessions, we want to find our qualified supply zones are going to be above all this, okay? They're going to be above all this. Um, next, when we have this right here, okay, this thing, um, it's going to take, it, it'll, if you get up to this 18, uh, and remember, this is easier to see on a four-hour chart. You, well, you don't see it. There's a little supply zone here that we were focused on uh, a few few FX Street sessions ago, but uh, a few sessions ago, but uh, it's it's there. We're on a bigger time frame here just so we can see it in one screenshot. But here's something that's very important to look at. A lot of people don't talk about this. When, and this same thing goes for demand here, but you see how before this area we have this here? Now, I'm not saying this is any great supply zone or even a qualified supply zone, but nevertheless, price stopped here and then fell. Clearly, supply exceeded demand when that happened. So for price to, when price comes back to this area here, you could see it gets stuck here for a while. And this is this is days, right? Price spends days in this area filling the sell orders or supply, right, in the gold market here, and then finally gets up to the next fresh zone. And this is actually the qualified supply zone up here that you're talking about. Okay? But think about it. Now focus on the supply-demand imbalance, both sides, supply and demand. When price does get up to the 1876, how much buying had to happen to get through that, right? A lot of buying or demand was uh, happened or was filled for days and days and days, and then finally price goes higher into the 1876. So now think about what's happening in 1876. The supply side is, is, hasn't changed, but the demand side has. The demand side has changed dramatically because of this, meaning price is hitting 1876 with fewer buyers or, or much less demand because this is here. Does that make sense? Not, in other words, creating a much larger imbalance at 1876. Let me say that a different way. The imbalance at 1876 is much greater on the supply side because this was here and price had to get through this first. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Well, that's all that matters. It's all about the imbalance. That nothing else, nothing else, uh, nothing else matters. It's that. Okay. Yeah, let's go take a look at, uh, we can certainly look at the NASDAQ, which is now negative. That is a big drop. So NASDAQ just fell well over 100 points. Yeah, let's take a look. You know, but again, look at how far, we're still far from bad location demand zones, right? I mean, the NASDAQ could fall, fall another 200 points. It's still Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're looking for the, let's get rid of that. It's an old area. You want a 10 minute chart. And let's see, you're looking at 16,433. So this thing right here. Right. Um, this area right there, let me actually take us down to a smaller time frame here. Yeah, that's why I did that. So, 
Yeah, so uh, those wicks on that bigger time frame, you know, told my brain to come down to a smaller time frame. So I just came down to a little bit smaller time frame. But you see how here price just goes up, goes down and rallies? That suggests that the demand is down in here, right? There's the, here's where 33 is, right? But that's not where price really rallied from. Price took off from down here. Okay, so we'd look. We would look actually uh, below that. All right, like this area of supply right here, that just worked out pretty well just a few minutes ago. Notice price doesn't come down and then go up and then go down. You see that here, price goes up, comes down and goes up. This is clearly there's a supply demand battle going on here, and then clearly the supply side works out, which is why. You know this uh, this works, and also price is falling here because you don't have much to stop it. Oh, we might get a bounce at this area. Okay. All right. You always too when you when you look at the futures like this, we always want to know: Are we looking at an overnight demand zone or a demand zone created during the? Uh, the day session. Okay. All right. Um, any other markets you want to look at? And I'll I'll try to stick to the theme as we uh, as we go. We can certainly look at the FX markets also. Uh, even though the dollar is just uh, there's no point looking at. Well, we could look at the dollar, but it, it really hasn't moved. We can update uh, the zones that we're looking at. Why don't we do that? We always try to update the dollar when we have our FX Street sessions, which are uh, once or twice a month. First of all, when we look at the daily chart sitting above the highs, now we're not near this at the moment. Um, you know, but we're not that far. Just above 97. We're likely to, uh, the dollar's been here a couple times. Notice it can't even get to that zone. So that's uh, certainly an area to watch. And then looking on the uh, demand side, we have the 9550 that's been tested twice. When I say tested, that means prices touched the, that area twice and took off. That suggests, that secondary evidence suggesting a, uh, you know, there's still a big supply demand imbalance there. Right, so 97 uh, is the area of supply above, 95.50 below. And again, remember we talk about location, right? You have to get below all this. We don't want to take anything inside that. Uh, well, it's not that we can't take anything inside that. We just want to know that it's inside that. So if you're a, an active trader, here's a supply zone that's inside of the of the range I just showed you, right? Remember, 97 is the top of that. The supply zone above the range, 95.50 is the demand zone below the range. Here's a supply zone at 96.30. But remember, when we go down to a, a day trading type time frame, we're applying the same concept. Here's that recent and relevant range. Here's the supply zone above it. Again, notice price, you know, can't even get through that, suggesting there's a good size supply demand imbalance here. So if the dollar hits this, we'd be looking at other uh, FX demand zones, right, with that inverse inverse relationship. For example, we can go to the euro, and if we do, we'll, um, oh, I can go to the spot market too, we're looking at the futures here. Okay. Same concept, same picture. Here's the here's the range. Here's the demand zone below the range that would, is likely to line up with that supply zone in the dollar above the range. Here's the supply zone in the euro, 114.65. That's likely to line up with that dollar demand zone below the range at um, about 95.50. Right. Always looking for that. You know that opposing zone. 
if we move out to the spot market, let's move out to the spot, uh, the euro dollar spot, which is right here. Okay, so here we are looking at, um, let's start with a smaller time frame and work our way up. The euro, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but notice the demand zone that qualifies is below all of this. Same concept, price touches the zone and shoots in the other direction. Why? Banks, financial institutions are big buyers and sellers down here. Oh, I'm sorry, you know what, the, the chat was not scrolling, so I missed some stuff in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, let's see, now I, now I see. Uh, Kareem, though, I see your question above about market hitting supply, then you see it start to roll over and it's moving lower. Um, is it still good to short? We don't do that. We, we sell short you know, as it's coming up to the supply zone or at the supply zone, right? Just our entry has us getting in just before the supply zone. We don't wait for prices to turn uh, before getting in, okay? And, um, you know, I think a lot of people have sort of a question like that. And I think the reason you're asking is because I think what you're really saying is, and I could be wrong is, shouldn't we wait for some confirmation that price is going to turn? Is that, that's kind of what, that's probably the thought that's in your head, right? Because uh, a lot of people are looking for that. They're like, well, wait, I don't want to buy it at demand yet because what, shouldn't I see if price turns and yet or price, right? But here, here's, here's the thing. If, um, let's say for, for any, for people that wait for price to turn and then get in, I mean, how is that, there's, there's nothing in that scenario that's telling you the price is going to continue to move. If anything, price is more likely to move in your direction from the supply zone than selling short after it's fallen from the supply zone. Again, that's why the technical analysis traders, the trend traders, that's why they, they run into trouble. Again, that's why the majority of active traders lose money. Right? They enter in the middle fair value. Remember we talk about supply, demand, and fair value. Again, I'm going to go over a lot of this in a lot more detail in that, in that workshop tomorrow, but, um, but that's the concept if you've been to one of those. So there's that demand zone there. Um, something else to point out here. Um, you see this area right here? If you look inside this range, you'll see there's plenty of what look like demand zones like that, rally base rally, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, right? But they, they don't work. It's not that so it's not that demand doesn't exceed supply there. When price rallied away from this, that only happens because demand exceeds supply. Here. But it doesn't mean there's a big supply demand imbalance here. Obviously there wasn't a big one. There was enough for this to happen, but then when price comes back, there's not enough demand in there. It's because all this stuff is inside the range. We need to get below it all about structure and uh, location, right? So as I mentioned earlier, um, I do have to, we do have to make this session um, uh, shorter than normal. So kind of have to wrap it up here, uh, but hopefully went over is helpful. And um, uh, again, we have more FX Street sessions coming up. If you want to join me, you know, tomorrow, um, there's that link in the chat. And um, you would go to the advanced workshop and, and this one right here. Um, but um, again, structure, location, but location is the key, right? Location is key. Supply demand zones outside of the range. We went over a few examples today. And again, you can see why those equities are no problem that they, they fall so much because the demand zones are lower. All right, have a great rest of your day. Maybe see some of you tomorrow, or we'll see the rest of you at the next FX Street session. All right.